Hello, welcome to the Family Law Cafe podcast. Today I have Karen Kipping with me. She is a specialist in domestic abuse. Karen, thank you for joining me. My we've, pleasure. We've known each other for a while and I was really interested in getting on the podcast because domestic abuse is something that is very relevant to family law. Um, either people may come to a family lawyer to seek help for domestic abuse or it may be part of their case even if it's not the main part and of course people get separated when there is abuse so you are a specialist um, you've written a book about this subject so um, can I ask you first of all um, how did you come to get involved in this area so over 20 years ago now I went through my own divorce after a very coercive marriage and there was no support available at that time and it took me a lot of years really to work out how to manage my ex's behaviour and how to recover and that led me down a path of training as a domestic violence advocate and I worked for my local domestic abuse charity in various roles for about 16 years and over the last sort of four or five years, I was becoming very aware that there was a real gap in services and support for people, both women and men, that were still experiencing financial abuse. There was a lot of issues with people around the children, still a lot of conflict there. And people were going through really terrible divorces and separations from very controlling ex-partners and there just weren't really any support services and also for people that work in this field solicitors police officers social workers teachers etc there was nowhere for them to go really and they were really worried about confidentiality so i did a bit of additional training in divorce coaching and set up my practice nearly five years ago now and so all my caseload now is really supporting people that are going through those kinds of situations. People can come to me right at the very beginning when they're still trying to assess whether they are in an abusive relationship or not because lots of people don't recognise it, they struggle to recognise those signs and it's a spectrum so right through to the other side when people have been through the family law process and all of those proceedings have concluded, but they still might be struggling. They can come to me at any time. I also understand that you are an IDVA. Yes. And what does that stand for? So that stands for Independent Domestic Violence Advocate. So that really is somebody who is a victim specialist, um, somebody who has a lot of knowledge and expertise about safeguarding, about criminal law, about civil law, about people's rights, about what their options might be if they were to leave an abusive relationship. So we understand about housing rights, we understand about children's matters, um, but it's mo much more than that as well. It's about safety planning, risk assessment. It's about um, having those links into statutory services, voluntary services, of, you know, sources of support. And it's about really looking at that whole person what is going on in their life, what is making life much more stressful. It's very practical um, support, as well as obviously emotional support. So if someone um, needs an IDFA, how would they, well firstly, would they need to pay for the services? So there are different types of IDFA. So you get IDFAs that traditionally work for organisations like Women's Aid, so they're based within the charity sector. Um, brilliant sources of support if you meet those thresholds. Um, usually they support medium and high risk uh, victims of domestic abuse. Again, very practical support, lots of links with police and social care and education, etc. But there are, again, certain people that can't access that support because they don't meet the risk threshold. So for my work as an IDVA, I do a lot of the work um, supporting people through family court. 
So since the new practice direction came in last year, I'm now in quite a unique position where I can actually be with people in the court and sit with them, provide that guidance to them. I don't provide legal advice. Um, it's slightly different to a Mackenzie friend as well, but it means that I can be there to, to provide that emotional support throughout the day to give them some tools and strategies and techniques that are, going to, that are going to make that process much less stressful for them. Really want to come back to um, the role of IDVAs in family court and the practice direction. So I'm just going to come back to that. So that people get a little bit more understanding about you, um, I know that before, well, I'd like to know what you were doing before you went into this area. So what was your background before that? So I worked in the NHS. I was midwife for 20 years. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes I did see people coming through the health setting that had been victims of domestic abuse as well. So I had that kind of knowledge and expertise. And again, that led me into one of my roles as a health advisor at one point. And also, I know that you've written a book, which I've read, found that um, incredibly useful. So what's the title of the book? So it's Recognition to Recovery, How to Leave Your Abusive Ex Behind for Good. And I wrote that book because I had lots of professional knowledge, as well as obviously my personal experience and lots of knowledge that came from my clients, really. Lots of tips, lots of um, scenarios and, and things that I thought people really needed to hear because when you when you're going through domestic abuse yourself you really feel like everything that's happening to you is very unique to you and of course it's not quite often it's very textbook stuff so by sharing some of these examples I was hoping that people would read the book and go oh yeah that's happening to me yep I've heard that one before oh okay that's how I get out of it you know they need to know practically how to get out of abusive relationships safely because leaving is the most dangerous time and uh, I wanted to share my tips and strategies and tools to help people in those early days when it can seem easier to go back to the relationship than it is to leave. So through the book there's lots of quotes um, I found those very useful. I, as a lawyer I it will commonly be said to me, this case is completely different, you just won't believe this one, or my situation is very complex, very different. Um, that's not true when you see a lot of them. I've been dealing with family law since <clears throat> 1992. Uh, so uh, I think part of domestic abuse is about isolation. So people will feel very frightened to talk. And uh, the recognition part of your book, so if someone can get this book and read the part about recognition, it may take them some time, I would imagine. Would you agree? Yeah. And sometimes they will dip into different parts of the book and they might go back and reread things. I have lots of clients that tell me they've highlighted certain bits in the book, things that really resonate with them. Uh, sometimes they're not quite ready to appreciate the information in the book, uh, it might take a few times. And as you've explained, leaving uh, is a very dangerous time. And it may be that the abusing party will really emphasise how dangerous it is that that person who may want to leave, there, there's so many obstacles that are real and obstacles also in their mind. So it is a, a massive challenge, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, they instill this culture of fear and dependency as well. So you feel like you can't leave, like the barriers to leave in are too huge. But actually, sometimes all it takes is reading a book or having one conversation with somebody that really does understand your rights and who can show you that light at the end of the tunnel that you need. And that can be the thing that gives you that inspiration, that hope, that courage to make that change. 
but you have to do it safely. And there's been legislation, as you said, 20 years ago, you were struggling on your own. I remember doing cases 20, 30 years ago where there wasn't the platform to raise points in the way that there is now. There's certainly judges who would recognise patterns and incidents, but it was on a case by case basis. So it should be better now. Though I have to say, I always find the law is incredibly slow to catch up. Um, so it's not perfect. So let's look at some of the legal sides. Um, there is a legal definition of domestic abuse. Rather than just give that out now, which is like I'd say to anyone watching this, just Google it. It's a legal definition of domestic abuse. It's pretty wide now, isn't it? It is. It can be an incident or incidents, and it's just you know just summarising mass massively. Um, just have a look at it. Have a think about in your situation: Are you being made dependent? Are you in a pattern of abuse? Something I was thinking about, and just tell me if this is completely. Um, off topic or random. Um, abuse is a bit like being allergic to something. It might be loads of other things in the cake, but you know, if the abuse is there, that's not somewhere you should be. That's not something you should go near. So like, you know, if you're allergic to an ingredient, um, there can be a lot of excuses because abuse is often mixed up with a lot of love and care and all sorts of sorrow and thank yous and flowers. So how are people going to recognise if they're in this situation? What would you suggest? So generally it follows a cycle. So you have a period where things will be very calm, everything will be okay, maybe even nice. Um, but generally that is while you're abiding by certain rules and you're doing what's expected of you. But the minute that you do something outside of that, maybe you challenge your partner a little bit more or you question them, um, or you know, sometimes you don't need to do anything, they will just think of an excuse to justify their anger or their jealousy. And then it will all start to escalate. And then there will generally be an incident or an argument or something like that and you might be very worried about having an opinion. You may be very worried about repercussions, you know, what you should and shouldn't say, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Um, and like you say, then they, you know, they may apologize, they may treat you kindly for a little bit, things may settle down, but then it all starts again. And if you are worried about your partner's reaction to anything, if you're scared of them, nobody should be scared of their partner. Nobody should be thinking, I wonder what mood they're going to be in today. I need to keep the children quiet because otherwise they're not going to like it. You know, you have so many rules that you have to live by to keep things calm in an abusive relationship, but that's not right and nobody should have to live by all these rules and your opinion does matter and you're, you should be allowed to have a voice. So the government introduced in the criminal law coercive and controlling behaviour. <clears throat> I think I'm right in saying it's 2017, section 76 of the Serious Crimes Act, something like that. Anyway, have a look, have a look, Google it. Coercive and controlling behaviour in my mind, people get a little bit confused about this. Can you help help me to understand what does that mean? How do you know if there's coercive and controlling behaviour? So the coercive control is a huge part of abuse in a relationship, really. A lot of people still think of abusive behaviour as physical abuse, but it's actually not a huge part. And sometimes it never turns into physical abuse. It, that, if it's going to, that physical abuse tends to happen much later on in the relationship. Can I just stop you there, just because I'm so interested in this? It seems to me there's an escalation. If someone can control you by words, they will. If then they need to up the ante and there's a threat, 
well, then it might become physical. But it's all about control, isn't it? Would that yeah. be fair? Yeah, absolutely. So the coercive control is the subtle stuff that goes on. So it is those things like belittling you, putting you down, criticising you in front of other people, isolating you from friends, from family, maybe not allowing you to have your own income, uh, making you justify all your spending, um, criticising your parenting, real subtle things. That, what you wear, can that be? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's very common. What you wear, how much makeup you wear, what you look like, who you should be talking to, who you shouldn't be talking to, where you should be going. Monitoring. Yeah, phones. monitoring. Mm -hmm. And of course, again, it's a spectrum. So it can start off very subtly and it kind of drip feeds into the relationship slowly, slowly. So you don't really know that it's happening. Like the frog. Yeah. Like Explain the frog. that if people so, don't know. So the frog analogy is if you put a frog into boiling water, the frog will immediately jump out. So I, I always say if somebody punched you in the face on the first day, you wouldn't go back for a second day, would you? But they don't do that. Um, with the frog analogy, if you put a frog into cold water and you turn the temperature up slowly, 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 the frog doesn't realise what's happening. The frog will sit there quite happily till it boils to death. So it's that gradual, and I think for some people it can be, did that just happen? There was a, there's an incident and they have to second guess themselves. You know, they might have, um, I mean, you describe in your book love bombing, which is that just everything coming at you very, very fast. Yeah. I was thinking a relationship that starts really, really fast. It can seem so flattering. But is it flattering? Is it, you know, this person's so struck by you that just every minute they're there, their presence and quick, uh, very quickly into the relationship, living together or marriage, that can be a red flag, can't it? Yeah, absolutely. But like you say, it can be really confusing because these kind of relationships can feel very passionate. They can be very intoxicating. You Everything know, really... we're taught, isn't it, from, from being a child is like, you know, the handsome prince yeah. or you know. promising you the world you know tapping into all of those hopes and dreams that you've been wanting perhaps for a long time and it's it seems very attractive at the time and it's not until later on you maybe start to question things a little bit and think why did they say that actually that makes me feel really hurt uh, was it me? Did I say something wrong? Did I do something that's maybe provoked them a little bit? So yeah, people do question themselves a lot. They take on a lot of blame for the other person's behaviour as well, a lot of responsibility for that. Do they feel shame for being in that relationship? They've brought this on themselves somehow? Yeah, they, they can feel very ashamed. Perhaps feeling stupid, that they didn't spot the signs, being duped into the relationship. They've got children maybe by then. Yeah, uh, maybe other people have tried to tell them, you know, tried to warn them and they've dismissed it. And of course, you know, you, be you do become very isolated within that relationship. So it's very difficult then to reach out to people, to go back to friends and family that you've lost touch with and say, look, I'm really sorry, but this has happened to me. Always compare it to those people who you see on a video, they're walking one way very purposefully and then they realise they're walking in the wrong direction and they do anything they can to not turn around and start walking the other way because they feel rather stupid. But I mean, that's trivialising it obviously massively, but it almost feels as if people get, they're so invested in a relationship that that can be a real problem, can't it? Yeah, and they will try everything to make it work. You know, like you say, if you're tied together because of finances, because of children, because you've made a whole life together, you've got a lot to lose, essentially, if you leave that relationship. And, you know, that's a bit of a process for people. Some people will leave a lot quicker than other people. For some people, it can take them 20 years, 30 years before enough is enough. And we've implicitly um, been indicating we're talking about women but we know that domestic abuse is not gender-based but tell me what the risks are for women 
For women, uh, the risks are more serious in terms of the physical violence. Um, a lot of the research does show that women are much more at risk of sexual violence, or physical violence, particularly if the relationship is ending or if there's an escalation due to pregnancy um, and those kind of so scenarios. So physically vulnerable yeah. and two women a week will die. Yeah. So that's a sobering statistic. And uh, I always say to people, you know, just because your relationship hasn't been physical, it doesn't mean that you are safe. It doesn't mean that there's not always the potential for that to happen. So it's really, really important if people are recognising that they're in an abusive relationship, that they get expert advice around safety. Yeah, safety planning. I think there's slightly a different nuance with men from what I've seen, because obviously I see a lot of cases um, men and women and well one thing I will say is often the fact that there is domestic abuse doesn't come out immediately it might I might be eight months into a case before I realize that there's been very serious domestic domestic abuse and I just wonder whether there's much more of a sense of shame uh, because I find that the women I'm assisting it will they will be more open to giving me that information with men often it's buried or I might have to ask is that your experience? It is. And I think with men particularly, they really struggle to recognise that coercive control. They can very much excuse it or minimise it. Um, and it becomes quite normal to them. So it's really up to us as professionals to tease out that information, to really ask them the right questions and importantly, give them that confidence and that understanding to disclose the reality of what's happening, but also to reassure them and also to give them advice about their options, because there are a lot of judgments made about people who experience domestic abuse generally, but I think for men particularly, there's still a lot of stereotypical views that it doesn't happen to men or that men should man up. You yeah, know. they're less of a man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's absolutely not the case. Which makes it worse and more insidious in lots of ways to me. I just wonder, um, you know, that the mental health side of that is, I think, is really big. Yeah. We know men don't talk about a lot of issues and this is just one of those issues. Yeah. So I interrupted you. I wanted to talk to about safety planning. Explain what that term means. So it's really looking at what's happening now looking at perhaps behaviours that have also happened in the past so we can try and predict what they might do in the future. Um, perpetrators of, of abuse are pretty stereotypical and that does mean that we can look forward, we can become more proactive by predicting what they might or might not do. Um, and so we really look at all aspects of safety, your personal safety, your safety at work, safety of the children, perhaps at their nurseries and their schools, um, your social support, social media, um, every aspect really to make sure you've got as much safety and as many practical things in place. And I know that there are many charities and there's, there's you know, again, if you can Google this, you can look at Women's Aid and what I would suggest could be important, I'd be interested in your views on this, is that people, if they're facing that, or they've made the decision, they want to leave, that they do get support because there are people that will come and have a coffee with them, quickly do an assessment and make a plan rather than trying to do it yourself or with maybe a member of your family, that there are a lot of professionals out there, aren't there? Yeah, absolutely. and. If you go to one professional and you don't get the right response or you feel that you need more advice, just keep asking, go to different professionals. But absolutely, those domestic abuse organisations, all of their support is free, it's um, confidential and they are the experts and they will absolutely do that risk assessment, give you some initial safety advice and talk you through your options. Or you can come to somebody like me who will do the same kind of thing um, and obviously get your legal advice as well 
um, about your options. And if you if you have time, um, it's really much more beneficial and safer if you can make a plan. Yeah, I I I hundred percent agree. Um, I just wonder sometimes people just get to a breaking point. But even I suppose if they do take action, try and get a catch up and try and get some expertise on your side because you're not going to be the only person. Just looking at the legal options, of course, you will know that um, people can go and get what's called a non-molestation order. Slightly, I think it's always slightly strangely named. I can remember years and years ago, um, just being in court and people not really understanding. I'm not molesting anyone. It's got a sort of strange connotation, but we still use the term non-molestation order. Um, as some judges will explain I, I'm to the um, person that they want to make this order, I'm, I'm stopping you doing what you shouldn't do anyway, because there are criminal laws to um, cover these things. But a non-molestation order broadly should protect um, the person, usually made for six months or to a specific time. Um, you can apply without notice, or you can apply on notice. There's a, a legal test Usually people will apply without notice, won't they, when they uh, really need protection because this order will then give them protection and, and then they will come back. Um, and people can apply for an occupation order. Just interested in your perspective of how well that works for people that come to you. I, as a lawyer, know that that can be very useful, but it can also heighten the tension as well. So what, what's your perspective on the use of non-molestation and occupation orders? I think it's very much up to the individual what they feel they need. Um, you know, they know their abuser better than anybody. And like you say, some people will 100% abide by those orders and it will be enough of a deterrent to get them to curb their behaviour. Other people will not abide by it at all, will see it as just a bit of paper, and actually even just having to go to court to defend themselves against such an application can, like you say, trigger them, cause them to become more angry, more jealous and can escalate situations. So it's absolutely not for everybody. Um, like you say, there are other criminal measures that you know you can go down. So I think it's important to really understand all of your options. You know, there are other options such as domestic violence protection notices and domestic abuse. Yeah, I was about to notices. raise those. What do you think of those? Because that's where the police can issue a 28 day notice, not even your choice. If they're called, they have um, the right to issue those um, a notice um, and get a um, domestic violence, oh, domestic abuse protection order. Uh, for 28 days. I think that's a great idea because it doesn't then put the onus on the victim, does it? It's just the police saying, enough. This is what we're going to give you 28 days to get your advice. How often are they being used, do you find? Not and, enough. Yeah, that's not what I, that was my feeling. Not They're enough. not being used enough. And I think, unfortunately, the members of the public don't know that these orders exist. Mm -hmm. That it's even an option, yeah. which is a real shame because they can be so useful. Mm. Um, and police definitely are not uh, proactive. Do you, sorry to, to interrupt because I just can't help myself. Often it's like, well, we've come to you because the police have told me I've got to get a non molestation order. So the police saying, you know, that, and I just wonder if it's different in different areas. But the police have um, the ability to, to deal with it, but they tend to say to people, go and do it yourself, which I think is another obstacle to them. Don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree. You know, the, the, those domestic abuse protection orders have been made available to make it easier for people to get the advice and the support that they need. And that 28 days can really make a huge difference by keeping the abuser away, by giving the victim some headspace, some time to just really realise what life can be like without having to abide by all those rules that we were talking yeah. about earlier yeah. and to get the professional support that they need and then start to make some decisions about whether they want to stay in the relationship or whether they want to end it and how they want to end it. You know, do they want to stay in the same home? Do they want to leave? Do they want to go to a refuge or whatever? But 
it's not always as easy to go and get a non-molestation order. You know, if you haven't got a lot of evidence, if a lot Just to of say, if your mind is scrambled as well. Yeah. Yeah, you know, because law is a very logical place where everything has to be done properly. If your mind is completely fuzzy and scrambled. Sorry, yeah, sorry. And, al and also, you have to go to court mm. to get that order, mm. which is daunting in itself for anybody. Mm. When you're very emotional, you know, the incident has just happened, it's all escalated, it's all become very dramatic and f can feel very scary. And then you've got to go to court to defend yourself and have your abuser in the same courtroom as you, listening to everything that you're talking about. Because all those papers have to be served on your abuser, then they might get a lawyer and come back because if you went without notice, it would be a short-term order. It is free to make the application, so that's good. There's no court fee, well, great. But um, it, it would, it's, you probably need a lawyer to help you to get to, to assemble your paperwork. And then there's going to be a short-term order, probably going to come back in two or three weeks. And um, then you're going to be dealing with perhaps the abuser who's got a lot more money than you and access to more funds. I mean, there is, there's lots of arguments here. I don't want to be just putting it on, on, in one way. Um, but it it's, seems like a very, and well, I, I want to just let, say that actually quite an expensive way of doing it if you think about it if you used the police use that ability to make these 28-day orders could be quicker I mean breach of a normal station order once it's made is a criminal offence so it goes into the criminal courts it's very serious so what about tell us about Claire's law and what that is how does that help uh, victims so Claire's law is um it's where you have the ability to ask the police for information about your partner. So if you have a concern that they may have been abusive in the past to previous partners, if you are maybe questioning the relationship, wondering whether you want to stay in the relationship or whether you want to end it, and you're questioning it because of some of the behaviour, by your partner, you can go to the police proactively and you can say, I want to do a Claire's Law application. I want you to give me information about my partner's past. If there's any, anything there that is relevant to me um, and also close members of your family or other professionals can also pro request, yeah. proactively make that request if they're worried about you. Mm -hmm and uh, the police will go away and they will search their databases. And if that person has any relevant domestic abuse convictions, they will share that information with you. And you're not allowed to divulge that information to anybody else, it's just specifically for you. But the purpose of it is to help you make uh, an informed decision, I suppose, because Perpetrators of abuse are master manipulators. They are very clever. They lie. You know, I've had several cases over the years where people have been duped into these kinds of relationships and then they do a Claire's Law applica application and realise that this person has got a long history of abusive relationships yeah. and they had no idea. Yeah, well, knowledge is power, or yeah. it should be certainly of assistance. Um, just want to touch on the last area I'm going to cover with you, which is when there are then <clears throat> Children Act proceedings, financial remedy proceedings, as is likely to happen after a separation when you're dealing with an abuser and how people can be supported. Now, of course, we know in, if there's a Children Act application, we've got Practice Direction 12J, which says that domestic abuse um, needs to be considered at the, at the first appointment and any directions made so if there if domestic abuse is a feature then there may well be what's called a fact finding hearing um, and I've known lots of children cases that I deal with where the the, the abuser is very plain um, to the court and to the lawyers what's going on but you get into these long sort of 18 months worth of litigation which are incredibly draining so your role as an IDFA, what, and, and, so, and also in financial remedy proceedings, that can make things extremely difficult. So 
what can you, how can you assist in, in those situations? Right at the very beginning, my role is um, uh, kind of in the background. So you have your legal advice, your legal team who are talking about strategy, who are um, maybe discussing with you about next steps and hearings that might be coming up. So I kind of work in the background, helping explain the strategy perhaps, or explain how the proceedings go, if you're likely to be questioned or not be questioned, preparing the client to go to court, you know, emotionally, you know, so helping them feel more confident, feel calmer, um, helping them have some understanding of how the court hearing itself is going to play out. Uh, and I can help them also with making decisions because quite often what we find is, you know, the, the legal team will have one perspective as to what might happen, but perhaps the client has got a lot of other things going on in their lives. Maybe, you know, they're having to make some decisions about do they want to stay in the marital home or do they not? Um, you know, maybe the schools with the children, perhaps they're trying to make decisions about those. Maybe they're having to make decisions about the contact schedule and the parenting plan. So I can help them really kind of think about some of that detail as well, um, so that they get a good parenting plan in place that will then make their life hopefully a lot easier in the long run. So sometimes it's just the finer details, um, helping them kind of fine tune some of that and think about some of those bigger issues. You can also go to court as well, can't you? We talked about that earlier as an IDFA. Um, do the judges know about this? The uh, they should do. <laughs> it's been in place since last April, so yeah. hopefully they do. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I can go to court and I love doing that um, side of my work with clients because it does make a huge difference. You know, I have clients that say just the thought of going to court makes them feel physically sick. Yeah. So, you know, to know that they've got their legal team there who can concentrate and focus on the legal side of things, yeah. but they've also got me there by their side throughout the day. You know, I don't leave them alone <laughs> and, you know, we can do a bit of prep before court. I can be there with them in court to help keep them calm, to help make sure they understand everything that's happening, to take notes so we can have a debrief afterwards and make sure they really kind of understand and process what's happened and what's going to happen next. It really takes a lot of the fear of court away from them. I breathe. <laughs> it's such a big topic. I feel we've skirted over, hopefully we've skirted, touched on some of the issues. Um, what I'm going to do now, um, obviously you're part of the Family Law Cafe na Network. Uh, we have other people in our network. I'm going to introduce you um, to the person who's going to be the guest for my next podcast. He's called Rob Elaine. Um, he is a specialist. He's an animal behavioural specialist. Now, I know from my work that there is an overlap. People that tend to abuse animals. There's a, there's a big overlap with they will abuse people. Um, and that during separation, there can be issues about animals after separation. I'm going to talk to him all about that. So I'm going to introduce him to you now um, and see what questions he has for you. Because I, um, I, I know that domestic abuse is such a big part of what we do as lawyers in family law people that are going through separation, that everyone should be informed about this. Even if they, they're not suffering from domestic abuse, at least they can be informed and just look for any signs just to sort of check that off. I'm going to introduce you to Rob. He's going to ask you some more questions. Thank you so much for coming. I've really, really enjoyed our talk. Thank you. Hi. Um, it was so interesting listening to what you were just talking about. Um, but from a purely selfish point, there was something I just wanted to touch on that you mentioned. Um, being a, a man who suffered from domestic abuse myself, uh, both physical and psychological, uh, when I found myself in that position, there wasn't really anyone to talk to. And when I tried, people just kind of didn't really take it seriously. And I know you said it's something that men can find embarrassing. But I think for me, the difficulty was, well, where do I go about this? You know, and, and I think it's very clear that, you know, women can report it to the police or they can go and 
reported their GP and they have all these options, but, but men don't really get given much information on what to do. So I found when I talked to a police officer about it and just said, look, this is what's happening, he just kind of pretty much, he said, well, you can restrain her, but not in a way that's too physical. If she comes at you with some sort of weapon, he said, you can push her off, but be careful to make sure she doesn't fall on anything where she may injure herself. And I'm thinking, she has a knife yeah. <laughs> and I've got to move her in such a way that I don't cause her any discomfort. I could get seriously hurt. And so I just kind of left it because I thought, well, I, that I don't know what I can do about it. So obviously, and I'm not belittling in any way the fact that the vast majority of cases are women. But when you are that man, what, what are your options? What do you do? Uh, 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 first of all, I'm really sorry to hear about your situation. I hope things are much better it's now. It's resolved now, yeah. Good. It is very difficult for men. And um, I think quite often, again, you know, there are judgments made about men and, you know, what they should and shouldn't do and what they're capable of, of doing and not doing. And it can feel incredibly isolating as a man when you when you do realize what's happening when you do realize that you're being abused and then you, there's nowhere to go to get any help and maybe even when you do reach out to get help and you start talking about it you don't get necessarily the most helpful response you know in that situation it would be probably been much more helpful if the officer had given you some a validation reassurance guidance about what to do other than just how to restrain somebody or how to physically protect yourself. You know, you could have had some guidance about other specialist organisations that you could have spoken to at that point or other options about your housing, perhaps, you know, other options about the law and protective measures that you could have maybe got at that point. And also encouraging you to get support from friends and family as well, you know, to start talking. Well, I mean, something you said earlier, which was so poignant, was that recognition that, that this is abuse. Yeah. And as a man, I kept dismissing it. Well, you know, I'm 6'1", she's 5'1", you know, it's not like she tried to kill me. And, but I still have scars, you yeah. know, that she caused that I never really talked about because I'm supposed to be the big man and you're supposed to be able to endure it. So I think firstly, that recognising that you are actually being abused. And then, and then you talked about that psychological abuse which had gone on long before that, that had kind of prepared me for tolerating the physical abuse. And I just think there's nowhere really that men get to talk about this and say, well, hang on, is this OK? And what are your options? And even when we ended up in court, I kind of never mentioned it because I just thought, well, nobody. And she used to say to me, well, nobody will believe you anyway. Look at the size of you. Look at the size of me. Who would believe you? And I used to think she's right. Yeah. So it kind of leaves men often with nowhere to go. And although we are often the abusers, rather than the victims. Those who are victims, I think often end up just not knowing what to do. It, is, it has got better over the years. There are organisations like Mankind UK, uh, there's a men's advice line. So there are a couple of national sp um, specialist organisations, um, but still very much they are a signposting service. Um, they do offer online support um, but local domestic abuse organisations have also developed their services to incorporate support for men as well. So many of the traditional women's aid type organisations do actually support men now as well, as well as people from other specific groups and backgrounds. So that's a real positive, but still there's a stigma for men about approaching some of those particularly women's led um, organisations. So I've definitely noticed a trend as such over the last um, few months where I've had more men um, contacting myself and approaching me. I spoke to a man last week and he said essentially you've summed up everything that my wife has been doing to me within a half hour conversation <laughs> with you and he hadn't really realised that what she was doing was abusive. Friends had told him before that they thought she was abusive but he hadn't really kind of understood it until we had that one conversation and then it was literally like a light bulb had gone off and he was like thank goodness I spoke to you because now I know that how I feel is 
valid. Valid, yeah. 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 I know exactly how he felt. And so it's great that things are beginning to change. And I think this is such a great opportunity to put that out there and say that, you know, you're not weak or you're not embarrassing. Um, you have a genuine problem that just like any other needs to be resolved and that there are now places perhaps that, that men will feel more confident to go. Yeah, absolutely. You don't have to put up with it. And, and also, um, there are areas in which our two work areas kind of cross over. Um, I also, uh, as a, a, a former animal welfare officer, which I was for 19 years, frequently dealt with abuse cases of animals. And as a dog trainer and as a behaviourist, what we find often is there is again a crossover. And so often what you find is the animal is being abused. And when you talk to the person about the animal, you find that the animal is not the only one. And uh, so there's this crossover sometimes where, although I'm going in to deal with a dog, I recognise very quickly, unless I can change what's going on between this couple, there's no way I can help the dog. And so I, fortunately, when I first started in this career, chose to go and study human psychology and look at counselling and the ways to communicate with people. And I think it's made me better at helping the dog because I've become better at helping the people. And really, as dog trainers, we're really human counsellors. We end yeah, up it's having all to try. Interlinked, and, isn't it? Very much so, very much so. And have you, do you find in your profession that often when you go into a house, maybe where you're dealing with people, you find that it's not necessarily just people. So it starts off as perhaps the wife instructing you about the husband. And then when you get there, you find it's not just the wife, it's the children. And then when you find it's the children, it may be the animal. But certainly I find that. And, and do you find it, it often goes beyond the initial complaint? Yeah, well, one of the questions that we ask within a domestic abuse risk assessment is about have they ever hurt or injured an animal it, you know in your home because there is that very obvious link lots of research has been done about the links between animal abuse and domestic abuse and often clients will tell me that they're really worried about their pets or that they're struggling to leave the abusive relationship because they feel tied to the other person because of the pets for example, I've got a lady at the moment, she's got lots of animals and she's trying to um, leave an abusive relationship, but where does, where does she go with all the animals? She can't find a place to rent where they will accept all these animals. So now she's trying to um, find homes for some of the animals and just take the two dogs with her because that seems to be a more acceptable um, option for landlords. But it's very difficult and it's heartbreaking for her, actually, because... Because their animals are often like their children. They are, and they're a really good coping mechanism yeah. for people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're so therapeutic, um, very calming. You know, they'll give you a cuddle, they give you lots of love when perhaps you're not getting that from, from the partner elsewhere. Yeah. And so we say to you, we can help you get away from your partner, but you have to give away your children. That's how they feel. Yeah. And that often they'll just rather put up with the abuse yeah. because they can't get rid of these, these inverted commas children. So they'd rather just keep enduring the abuse. And then they might ask me to come in and help with the situation that's making him hostile to the animal. And sometimes I've gone in and what, what you see very quickly is, oh, this guy wants to be abusive. Yeah. You can't resolve the issue with him and the animal because he doesn't want it resolved. If he's either going to be abusing you or abusing the animal, and if we resolve his issue with the animal, then he only has one person to abuse. At the moment, he has two and feels better. And I'm not ashamed to say, usually in those situations, I say, you have to get out. And I those, can't fix those, this issue. those kind leave. of abusive people, they use the animals because they know that that, you know, that really gets to you. Yeah. It gets to your heart. Yeah. You know, nobody likes to see their pet being abused. And so, they do that to punish you mm. and it's it's really heartbreaking and extremely difficult when you're the person on the receiving end of that and quite often again the victim will take on a lot of blame for what happens to the pet and try to adjust their behavior to protect the pet to protect the children which of course rarely work no no, it works short term, perhaps, but not long term. And it actually almost gives them the opportunity to find new ways to be creative about yeah. being abusive. Um, so I usually say, look, I remember recently going to one where he wouldn't even sit in on the con consultation. So she'd invited me in, said there's this issue, which very quickly became clear he was the issue. 
but she was taking all of the blame for it. Well, the dog won't do this. Well, the dog won't do that. Well, the dog won't do this. And maybe it was easier for her to look at the dog's behaviour than exactly. look at his behaviour because that was a bit less threatening feeling well because her. it makes her feel well it's a naughty dog yeah and i haven't got to say he's the problem yeah. because that's going to come back on me yeah. so can we both just blame the dog and you fix the dog yeah. and i explained to her i said listen absolutely you and i we could fix this dog but there's no way in reality we're going to fix this dog because he's not going to participate and i said it loud enough that he would hear and he looked up for the first time so i said you have to decide whether to keep him or keep him and my advice is, there's one right down there, keep that one. <laughs> I'm never going to get a job in the diplomatic corps. I've, I've resigned myself to that. <laughs> well, listen, it's been so fascinating um, covering this, and we could talk about it all day. But unfortunately, I've got to move on. Um, so I think Joanna's coming back in now, and she's going to have a chat with one or both of us. Um, but it's been lovely chatting. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.